Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's awesome to see 10 to 50 more than packed for such a wonderful reason. Uh, a tremendous honor to have Dr. Morris Chang back with us at MIT today. Dr. Chang, not only being an MIT alum, That's even before the formal introduction. Uh, uh, not only an MIT alum, but in my opinion, one of the most important innovators and industry leaders of the past 50 years, if not more. Uh, uh, Dr. Chang's speech today is part of our Manufacturing at MIT Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this event hosted in partnership with the School of Engineering and Dean Ananta Chandra Kassan. And now to make the formal introduction, please welcome Professor Cindy Barnhart, Provost of MIT. Thank you, John. I'd like to welcome you all to MIT's Manufacturing at MIT Distinguished Speaker Series. Today's lecture by Morris Chang promises to be illuminating and inspiring. Welcome back to MIT, Morris. We're honored to have you here. This is the fifth event in Manufacturing at MIT Speaker Series, which has included US Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Heidi Hsu, Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, and Ford of CEO Jim Lyko. I'd like to start by talking about Morris's deep ties to MIT. And then I will talk about his role as founder and former chairman and CEO of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, also known as TSMC, the largest chip manufacturer in the world. Morris earned bachelor's and master's degrees from MIT, both in mechanical engineering, after transferring from Harvard. <laughs> We're very proud of that move. <laughs> after leaving MIT, a moment that he said was pivotal he went on to pursue a career in industry and earned a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. Morris has called his time at MIT the most important part of his formal education and has said that it had a profound impact on his life. As with many success stories, it may have been failure that ultimately drove Morris's future triumphs. In a recent interview with the New York Times, Morris said, the greatest stroke of luck in my life was failing to be admitted to MIT's PhD program. It was then that he decided to try his luck in industry. His first job out of MIT was at Sylvania, and later Morris moved to Texas Instruments where he stayed for 25 years eventually assuming the role of the chief executive in charge of the company's worldwide semiconductor business. While at Texas Instruments, he foresaw Asia's potential to excel at advanced manufacturing. So he founded TSMC in 1987, just as the industry was looking to outsource its manufacturing to Asia. TSMC quickly became one of the most profitable chip makers and today, is the largest manufacturer of the world's most advanced chips and serves some of the largest global companies. Today, TSMC is a $500 billion business that produces chips for cars and iPhones and supercomputers. Chances are right now you have TSMC technology in your backpack or your pocket or your hands. In founding TSMC, he transformed the semiconductor in industry by pursuing a simple yet revolutionary concept to focus purely on manufacturing. Breaking from the competitors and creating its foundry-like platform and its heavy investments in R&D, TSMC became a destination for the industry and Morris became a titan of semiconductors. Morris, you've been a part of the semiconductor industry since the very beginning, and it's incredible to see you still at the center of it today. 
And fortunately for MIT, you're also central to our community. Morris became a member of the MIT Corporation in 1999 and today serves as a life member emeritus. In 2016, MIT reopened the doors of Building E52 after a renovation funded by a generous gift from Morris and his wife, Sophie. The building, which houses MIT's departments of economics and the Sloan School, is now known as the Morris and Sophie Chang Building, where future leaders come together to learn and to shape the future. MIT researchers have greatly benefited from access to advanced silicon fabrication technology through the TSMC University Shuttle Program. And TSMC has been active in collaborating with MIT on new devices, memory, and AI systems. For MIT, Morris is an extraordinary example of the lasting impact of our alumni, the lasting impact our alumni have on the legacy of innovation at the Institute. Today, Morris will discuss his path in building TSMC, how the company continues to produce chips on the cutting edge of technology, his assessment of the US chips industry and TSMC's investments in new fabrication facilities in Arizona. He's a pioneer who envisions the future and then gets right to work making transformative industrial change a reality. We're inspired by your example and eager to learn from your experiences. So without further delay, I'll turn this program over to you, Morris. Thank you again for being here with us today. Thank you, Cindy, for introducing me. And thank you, Suzanne and uh, John, for inviting me to give a talk here. And ladies and gentlemen, this uh, is a privilege and a pleasure to be back at MIT to give this talk. And uh, I faced uh, the largest gathering of faculty that I ever faced at lunch today, <laughs> and I was telling them that uh, memories simply flooded back uh, at me uh, uh, this morning uh, after I arrived here. I lived in several dormitories in the early 50s. I was here, I was at MIT between 1950 and 1955. And I lived in several dormitories, including the Graduate House, Baker House, uh, and a few other whose names I don't even recall now. Uh, uh, and a lot of distinguished professors. And at lunch, uh, one of the professors asked me whether there was anything uh, at TSMC, the company that I started, where at TSMC I had anything that I wished to do over again. Uh, and I said no. Uh, but nobody asked me whether at MIT there was anything I wanted to do over again. <laughs> If, they, if anybody did ask me that, I would have said yes. <laughs> I wanted, uh, I would have wanted to study harder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy, yeah, I think, just pointed out uh, that uh, I failed the PhD qualifying exam uh, twice, uh, <laughs> which was the maximum that they allow me to fail, of course. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, in retrospect, later in life, I said that was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me because I, you know, changed, I myself changed the course of my life after I failed the exam. 
but uh, at the at the time, uh, really, I really didn't think it was lucky at all. <laughs> well, anyway, um, let me um, first start this talk by telling you the histories of uh, the topic. This is uh, the final version. Lessons of a life in chips manufacturing from Texas to Taiwan. But actually has gone through several changes. My first version was a life in chips manufacturing from Texas to Taiwan. Then my second version was a life in chips manufacturing from Texas to Taiwan via Japan. <laughs> I'll cover that story uh, a little later. Yeah. Uh, and then the third version, the final version, is what you see here. But I really regret the addition of lessons. I mean, lessons, too many lessons. Uh, we, can, we can do with fewer lessons, frankly, you know. <laughs> Uh, at least I can do with fewer lessons. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, but uh, I had already sent the topic to Suzanne. <laughs> Too late to change. All right. Let me uh, start. Uh, I, I need to first uh, be uh, very uh, frank that I had uh, uh, hip joints surgery just two and a half years ago. And I never, never, I never recovered completely from it. If anybody, if your doctor tells you that you can recover from a hip joint surgery, well, he may be right if you're young. But if you are a 90-year-old like I was when I had a surgery, he was lying. <laughs> <laughs> I want to first talk a little bit about the pervasiveness of chips, and then uh, some highlights in the history of chips, and then I want to uh, talk about the foundry business model, and uh, then ta Taiwan's advantages in chips manufacturing, and then some lessons. Pervasiveness of chips, uh, I think we all know that. Uh, I should say that when I first went to Taiwan, to start TSMC 38 years ago. It was 1985. And uh, you know, chips weren't nearly so pervasive as they are now. So I was told to give a few speeches to the Taiwan uh, business uh, circles and to the public sometimes. So I started to talk about semiconductors, I said, well, I said, if you, there was no cell phone at that time. There were computers, but usually the computers are own, were owned by companies, big businesses, and not by people, not by individuals. So I said, uh, semiconductors, if you have a watch, if you have a a digital watch, then you are carrying a semiconductor with you. Well, and very few people even had digital watches. So, so anyway, but the situation has completely changed in the last 40 years. And the semiconductors are very pervasive now. And um, in uh, national defense, you know, drones, uh, missile guidance, and so on, Industry, industry and commerce, computers, and daily life, smartphones and cars, even washing machines. Um, uh, in a developed world of approximately two and a half billion people, nearly every person uses chips, chips products in their day-to-day -day life. Highlights in the history of chips. Uh, well, just uh, if you points of common knowledge, I guess. Um, 
The conductivity of semiconductors lies between conductors, such as metals, and insulators, such as wood, hence the term semiconductors. Semiconductors have certain properties which remained largely unexplored until 1947. Well, actually, you know, the word semiconductors, which I think virtually everybody understands now, but only when I first arrived in the United States in 1949, I bet you that only the scientists, only the physicists, and some chemists knew what a semiconductor was. Uh, I mean, that word was, was largely unknown until 1947. 1947, Shockley, Bardeen, and Bertain invented the transistor, which was based on semiconductors. And they invented it in Bell Labs. And that was worth a Nobel Prize. AT&T then began the experimental fabrication of transistors. Not anybody else, just AT&T, for five years. And in 1952, AT&T decided, AT decided that they would, back then, well, they were quite unselfish. Uh, and, uh, you know, they uh, decided that the transistor was too important to keep it to AT&T. So they licensed the transistor technology to various companies. And those companies included the big ones, well-known ones, well-known at that time, like RCA, GE, IBM, and also unknown ones, like Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments was very small and unknown at that time, in 1952. And various companies began to produce, and those companies that got licensed began to produce transistors. All right, now jumping ahead. In 1958, Jack Kilby, he joined Texas Instruments in 1958 with me. We joined together. Well, not on the same day, but in the same month, in the same month. May, May of 1958. Uh, in 1958, well, he invented the, uh, the uh, integrated circuit uh, a few months after he joined Texas Instruments. And Robert Noyce at uh, Fairchild separately, the two separately invented the integrated circuit uh, at almost the same time. Uh, and that was worth another Nobel Prize, the two of them. But actually, um, uh, only uh, Kilby got the Nobel Prize because by the time uh, Kilby got the Nobel Prize, uh, Bob Noyce had died. Uh, it was, I think it was 2000, and uh, Bob Noyce had died. Bob Noyce died in around 1990, uh, I believe. And uh, Kilby was the only one that got the Nobel Prize because of integrated circuit. And Kilby did say in his acceptance speech that if Bob Noyce were still alive, he would have shared the Nobel Prize with, with him. Yeah. Now, forward, fast forward to 1965, Gordon Moore predicted that Gordon Moore, who was a, a close colleague of uh, Bob Noyce, he predicted that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit doubles every 1.5 to 2 years. The prediction was later known as Moore's Law and remained valid for 50 years. And this was almost a miracle that something 
like this could be valid for 50 years. And uh, you know, Nobel Prizes are not given to engineers. <laughs> but, uh, but it was worth an IEEE Medal of Honor, which is often considered the equivalent of Nobel Prize for electrical engineers. IEEE, of course, stands for Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Uh, now, the exponential increase of transistor on a chip and the corresponding decrease of cost of the transistor allowed an ever wider range of applications. Chips started to become pervasive. Well, I will just give you an example. I looked it up. An example of how Moore's law would work for a baby's network. Let's say you, your son is born today, and you give him a dollar, one dollar. Well, if that dollar follows Moore's law, it doubles every uh, year and a half to two years. Your son will become a billionaire by the time he's 50 years old. A billionaire in 50 years. And, well, a billionaire, he, 50 years old, he's, he's still well able to enjoy his wealth, okay? But let's say he lives longer. And by the year he, by the time he reaches 70, he will have become a trillionaire. That's how Moore's law works. You, you can verify what I just said. You know. <laughs> it's Wikipedia. You can look up Wikipedia, or you can do the calculation yourself. Uh, it's a pretty simple calculation in logarithm. Up to the 60s, almost all chips were bipolar. That, that's, a, that's an important development. Up to the late 60s, almost all chips were bipolar, and U.S. companies dominated the manufacturing of bipolar chips. And European, Japanese companies played lesser roles, but they, they, they also made bipolar chips. Um, but the U.S. companies dominated. Now, the important development was MOS. MOS was developed in the late 60s and enabled smaller transistors than bipolar technology did. More so would not live for very long if it weren't for MOS, because when Moore uh, predicted his uh, Moore's law, there were MOS had not been developed yet. It was just bipolar. And bipolar, the density of transistors in bipolar uh, was uh, limited. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was MOS that allowed Moore's law to be valid for 50 years. And uh, MOS was developed in the late 60s, after Moore's law. So in a sense, Gordon was a little lucky, you know. Oh. <laughs> uh, and it was more transistors than bipolar, and thus more transistors per chip. Roughly, the maximum number of transistors on a bipolar chip, say one square centimeter, I mean, that's a fairly typical chip, chip size, one square centimeter. The maximum on a bipolar was about, 1,000, 10 to the third. I know that because I tried it. I, I tried, I, I tried to, 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 to put uh, 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 10,000 transistors on a chip, bipolar, and I failed. Uh, and actually, uh, Intel, 
at the same time uh, tried it. Uh, well, I'm sure they failed too, you know. That's why they went the MOS. We all went the MOS route. But the maximum number of chances on an MOS chip started at 10 to the third in 1970, the same time that, that we found out bipolar was limited to 10 to the third to 10 to the third. MOS started at 10 to the third in 1970 and has now increased to 10 to the 10th. Uh, that's where the trillionaire and the billionaire stuff you know, that I just told you uh, uh, came about you know, in 2023. Uh, in this day, now, right now, the most dense chips that TSMC makes, TSMC makes, has almost 20 billion transistors in on one chip, 20 billion. That's 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 two times 10 to the 10th. MRS displaced bipolar in the 70s and 80s, and as chips became more complex, technologies began to move from chip manufacturing to chip architecture and design. And that's an important development too, very important. You know. The first generation semiconductor people were mainly physicists and chemists, chemists and electrical engineers who worked on processing, how to make transistors or integrate it. The later generation, the second generation, I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't work on uh, how to make integral circuits anymore. They work on how to design, how to architecture integral circuits. The, so the later generation pe uh, semiconductor people, I'm the first generation. I mean, I mean, when I started in the semiconductor industry, you know, Designs were simple. There are only a thousand transistors on a chip. How complicated can it get? You know, a thousand transistors. Um, so you know, I, I didn't want to do simple things like that. I worked on how to make them, how to make them more complex. How to make them all all right? Then somebody had to design the architect the complex circuits, and that's the second generation. That's, that's when, you know, the microprocessor, the Intel people that invented the microprocessor came along. That's, that's when, you know, uh, all the uh, uh, Qualcomm people and Broadcom, you know, I mean, they are, they are no longer process people. They are computer scientists. And they, they think, they, they, they think at home. They don't have to work in the factory. <laughs> the first generation like me had to work in the factory. Uh, these people, you know, well, sure, they come to the office sometimes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they, well, they can anyway. They can mainly, you know, work at home. I almost uh, skipped over uh, my contributions. <laughs> uh, uh, as chips, uh, be, well, I was on on that on the second paragraph. As chips became more complex, technologies began. So on. I talked talked about that already. In the 70s, 80s, Japanese companies mounted a challenge for leadership in chip manufacturing. It fizzled in the early 90s. Why did it fizzle? Well, various reasons were given, but uh, one of the most important reasons, I think, was that it was the Plaza Accord. Plaza Accord. Uh, this was uh, reached in 1985, the same year that I went to Taiwan. There's no connection between the two, but 
it would just happen at the same time. Part of the court made the Japanese yen uh, upraise the the exchange rate was almost doubled in two and a half years. 1985, you, you look up the record, 1985, the Japanese yen to the dollar was, uh, I think, 250, 50 or something like that, 250 yen to, to a dollar. And two and a half years later, it was 100 something to a dollar, doubled. And that's the Japanese, you know, had to fold up with the uh, exchange rate rise like that. And uh, there were other reasons. Uh, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the Japanese uh, onslaught fizzled in the early 90s, actually in the late, in the very late 80s and in the early 90s. Now, in 1987, Morris Chan founded the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company based on an innovative business model, a dedicated semiconductor foundry. Again, this was not worth a Nobel Prize, but it was worth an IEEE Medal of Honor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Since the 90s, for three decades now, Taiwan and South Korea have taken on an increasing role in chip manufacturing, while the U.S. retains a dominant role in chip architecture and design. And in some other things, like uh, uh, equipment, manufacturing equipment for chips, U.S has a dominant role. Uh, of course, that role is shared by the Japanese equipment manufacturers and lately by uh, the Dutch Holland uh, manufacturers. But still, the US has a uh, very important role in uh, other aspects than just chip design and uh, uh, architecture. In chip design and architecture, the U.S. role is uh, more than dominant. It's, it's almost, uh, you know, unquestionably dominant. <laughs> All right. Now I, I mean, I fooled around with this diagram for so long that I eventually tired of it. I, I decided to just orally explain it to you. <laughs> if you will, if you will, just uh, delete the red line for a moment. Delete in your mind. Just don't look at the red line. Don't see the red line. So you, what, you have, what you have left now is just the black, the black line. That was the old business model of semiconductor manufacturers. The same company would do R&D on design, and most of them would do their own design tools. But of course, companies like Cadence and Synopsis, well, I'm, I'm looking at the red lines. So forget about it. <laughs> OK. And uh, these, these are so-called IDM, integrated uh, device manufacturer. They're integrated because they do everything, all the black bo boxes. Uh, and they, they, after designing the IC, they do the wafer fabrication, they do the packaging, packaging and testing, and then they and sell them. The only thing that TSMC did was to impose the red line. And just you look at the, uh, uh, the red line enclosure. 
wafer fabrication, research in R&D of wafer fabrication, and advanced packaging. And GSMG took that. Of course, later on, people started to say, well, that's the heart, that's the heart of our IDM business. Well, at the time, it wasn't really considered to be the heart, you know. Uh, uh, but after TSMC took it and succeeded with that business model, well, people began to, to be uh, a little envious about it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, anyway, that's uh, what the foundry business is just the red enclosure. Now, we did it in Taiwan. What were so special about Taiwan? Taiwan's advantage in chip manufacturing. Uh, talents, st substantial supply of high quality and dedicated. I underlined technicians, I underlined all of them because they were all very important, not just engineers, not just engineers, but technicians, operators. And actually, day after tomorrow, I'm going to have a dialogue on the subject of education in the Asia society. And I'm going to say that when we talk about education, we usually emphasize education of the elite, like, like the kind of education that MIT gives. The MIT students get. Oh. That's the education of the elite. But well, why is TSMC successful in Taiwan? Because TSMC also gets good, well-trained technicians and even well-trained operators from a lot of trade schools in Taiwan. Trade schools. Uh, they are, they are 10,000 miles away from schools like MIT uh, or Harvard. Uh, their students only aspire to make a good living as technicians uh, and even operators. Well, we don't really, Taiwan doesn't really have schools for operators but operators, but they are willing operators. I mean, they don't turn over, they don't leave their job as soon as there's something better, something that pays more. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they're almost like Japan. Uh, now I'm, I'm not gonna have time to talk about the life uh, in chips manufacturing from Texas to uh, Taiwan via Japan. I'm not gonna have time to talk about the via Japan part. But in Japan, you know, this, uh, when I was running the Texas Instruments, Japan plants, plants, the operators, First of all, we, we had our, our major, Texas Instruments major plants were in Houston, Dallas. Uh, and when I walked into the factory, all the operators would you know, start to look at me. You know, this is a new visitor, uh, curious. Uh, but when I walked into a Japanese plant, no operator ever looked at me. And then I asked, what is your turnover rate? I asked the manager, what is your turnover rate? Oh, no, they, I mean, these are all young women, uh, the operators. Oh, they don't, they don't, they don't leave 
unless they get married. Oh. A turnover rate is like 2% a year. Whereas in Texas, it was like, you know, 15% when there was a, a, a recession. A recession meant fewer jobs available. And 25% when uh, uh, the times were, were, were good. You know, I mean, they all, they all leave uh, when there's a better paying uh, job available somewhere else. Well, anyway, and, and that's, that's deadly uh, because it, 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 it takes about three months at least to train an operator. And if you have a 25% turnover rate, you can, just can't do it. You can't do any manufacturing. Can't do any chip manufacturing. And, and I still remember, you know, Jack Kilby. I was talking about Jack Kilby and I joining Texas Instruments almost at the same time. I just, I can remember, I mean, he, after he invented the, the integral circuit, they told him to run an integral circuit department. All right, so when he was doing that, and I was running a transistor department, and we, we two were walking uh, towards the cafeteria to have our lunch, and then a bunch of ladies, uh, operators, you know, just rushed ahead because, you know, only 30 minutes was allowed for lunch at Texas Instruments. A bunch of lady operators rushed ahead, uh, overtook us. Uh, and Jack Kilby said to me, well, I mean, these operators, do you realize, Morris, that some of them have never made a single good integrated circuit in her life. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because, you know, turnover is so rapid and there's not enough training. Uh, uh, well, anyway. Uh, all right, I covered the low turnover rate. And uh, geographical concentration, uh, you know, Taiwan is a relatively small island, but uh, they are, uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, major facilities, factories in three cities in Taiwan. And uh, however, they are all connected, all three cities are connected by uh, uh, fast trains. Uh, high-speed trains. And at any time, including now, oh, there will be a thousand or more engineers, not operators or technicians, a thousand or more engineers assigned to another city, another city other than his home city. Uh, they, we provide dormitories. TSMC provides dormitories. So they live in their dormitories. They go there from their home with the, on the rabbit train. And they go there Monday morning. And they live in the dormitories Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. And then Friday afternoon, they go home. At any time, there are over a thousand engineers doing that. Huh. Well, I mean, it's not fun life, really. But, but it's, it's effective for the company. And, and they are willing to do it. So, geographical, geographical country, and by the way, you know, it's learning curve theory, and I'm not going to 
explain it. You probably know it anyway. But it works, the learning curve, experience curve here. It works only when you have a common location uh, uh, and the common people. Uh, uh, it doesn't work if you have a lot of branches all over the place. Uh, learning is local. The learning curve works only locally. Uh, all right, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I said that. Okay, large cumulative experience. Uh, yeah. All right, shall we? Oh, yeah, and the uh, uh, ecosystem has been built over the last three decades upstream, uh, midstream, and uh, important uh, global. Semiconductor equipment manufacturers such as ASML, Applied Materials, Lamb Research, all having service centers, training centers, and labs in Taiwan. And downstream uh, uh, packaging and testing companies, so on. I think, yeah, we are. Uh... Lessons. Well, I... if, the, if there are any lessons. The susceptibility, susceptibility of a country to chip manufacturing seems, this is my opinion, seems to be related to the status of economic development of that country. Uh, frankly, the advantages that Taiwan enjoys today, those that I spent some time to discuss today, they were enjoyed by the U.S. in the 50s and 60s because I saw them, I witnessed them. In the 50s and 60s, I mean, I was first in Sylvania, in, in Boston, Route, Route 128, yeah. Woburn, Woburn. And then in 1958, I moved to uh, to Texas. And uh, so what we see in Taiwan, we saw in the US back then, 50s and 60s. And I think for Taiwan, they enjoy the advantage now, but I think they will lose the advantage. They will lose it to another country. I don't know who, maybe India, uh, maybe Vietnam, maybe Indonesia, in another 20 or 30 years. Uh, the economic model we have been following, free market, free trade, globalization, uh, all those are really in the past now for chips anyway. No, no globalization, no free trade, no free market. Well, I, I shouldn't say it absolutely. There's still some left, you know, some free market, free trade, globalization. But, but a lot of it, a lot of free market, free trade, globalization is already gone. And that's the most efficient and resilient model. Deviations from it, industrial policy, subsidization, self-shoring will make the world chip industry less efficient and less resilient. Less resilient? How? Why? Well, you look at in the Cold War period, uh, look at Soviet Union. They follow the planned economy model. Well, yeah. They always have shortage of things that people really need because it's plan economy and nobody can plan the economy wisely. And the government cannot plan it. So the resilient way is the free economy, uh, free market. Uh, the pervasiveness of, uh, of chips due to uh, logic, due to supply chain efficiency, if chip costs increase, its pervasiveness will lessen. However, after having said all this, 
I need, I should, I need to agree with everybody, I think, that national security consideration, of course, override everything. Uh, and uh, you cannot get away from that. Oh, well. I mean, heck, you know, without national security, we we'll lose everything, everything that we value. Uh, so let's, by all means, avoid even a Cold War, if we can. Anyway, this is my message. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 So.